Hello, my name is Ji Young Seo from Samsung Medical Center in Seoul, and I will be speaking on augmenting critical care capacity in pandemic. Pandemics have periodically threatened humanity from 1918 Spanish flu to 2009 H1N1 pandemic. At the end of 1219, clusters of pneumonia of unknown origin was reported from Wuhan, China, and nobody knew at the time that COVID-19 would become a pandemic to involve more than 12 million people with more than 2.7 million deaths as of today. This kind of pandemic can put a strain on the critical care system as we have seen in China, Europe, and Americas, and will threaten to dismantle the medical system. To avoid this catastrophe, medical community and the government need to have plans to augment the critical care capacity to meet the challenges. To prepare for a mass critical care event, including pandemics, it is very important to have an integrated disaster plan, including clear chain of command with involvement of intensivists from the planning phase, assessment of hazards and vulnerability, surge capacity plan in case of sudden increase in critically ill patients, triage strategy to effectively sort the patients so that they will get appropriate care. Also, Training is important to guarantee the plan will work when it has to. This kind of planning and training was very important in keeping the number of casualties to a minimum during the Boston Marathon bombing mass casualty event. For the Korean society, I think we are lucky in that we had two factors working for us in enabling Korea to respond to COVID-19 effectively. One was air pollution. These are two pictures taken from my office window from the same view. One, on a clear day with no air pollution on the bottom, and another, on a day with heavy smog on the top. Another was the social vaccine of 2015 Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS epidemic, in which my hospital, Samsung Medical Center, became the epicenter of infection. In all, 186 patients were infected with about 20% mortality. This was a scene at the MERS ICU of SM Samsung Medical Center during the 2015 epidemic. Now we are very used to seeing doctors and nurses with these white suits and powered air purifying respirators. But at the time, these images were astonishing to the public and the medical community alike. And when we posted these images, our Facebook page, they went viral. So the fre frequent air pollution, uh, due to frequent air pollution, the Koreans were very used to wearing masks. So there was little or, or no resistance to universal mask use and had the infrastructure of manufacturing these masks. Also, the experience of Middle East MERS epidemic in 2015 uh, for the general public, there was widespread awareness of dangers of coronavirus infection. For the healthcare centers, most had protocols ready, set up for isolation of suspected patients and testing. Govern for government agencies, there was improved communication, improved manpower, and people with experience uh, uh, with, with this kind of infections. And there were law in place allowing the use of technology in tracing contacts, tracking visitors, and notifying uh, healthcare workers about heightened risks. And early testing of contacts and at-risk population, even if asymptomatic, with early di dissemination of diagnostic tools was possible. So before the MERS epidemic, Korea had very few isolation rooms, very few epidemiology experts, and no protocols to handle this kind of pandemic threat. 
But after MERS, uh, we had larger number of isolation rooms, and there was a mandate for referral hospitals to have certain number of negative pressure isolation rooms, and that was very helpful. And there were larger pools of experts and law allowing us using uh, technology to trace contacts of patients and more detailed protocols to respond to pandemic threat at the national level, local regional level, and also at the individual hospital level. For example, this is the Infectious Disease Crisis Response Protocol and MERS Response Protocol of Samsung Medical Center. As you can see, both of which were established in 2016, right after the uh, MERS epidemic. Like I alluded to you before, for these protocols to be successful in real situation, simulation and teamwork training is very important. Uh, and this is myself here and also here, uh, getting trained on int intubating in a simulated MERS patient on two separate occasions. It is recommended that organizations prepare for three levels of mass critical care situations, namely conventional, contingency, and crisis. Conventional is a situation where a sudden increase in about 20% of critically ill patients, and it can be usually be handled with regular workflow. Contingency means about two times the usual capacity of critically ill patients, and it usually needs coordination at the regional state level. Crisis is the most extreme situation and signifies about three times the usual capacity. And in this kind of situation, you need to resort to extreme measures and the standard of care will be ch also changed with the goal of saving most lives, not doing best care for all. In this situation, coordination has to happen at the national level. Now, let's look at more closely at the four items that are important when augmenting critical care, namely staff, space, stuff, and structure. First and foremost is staff. As you know, Korean ICUs operate with much less doctors and nurses compared to other countries shown here for comparison, uh, Japan and Australia. In Korea, intensivists is not required to operate in ICU, and only minority of ICUs have nurse to patient ratio of one to two. Number of ICU beds per ICU specialist about three times higher than other countries. So in a pandemic situation, when many doctors and nurses are needed, this puts us in a great disadvantage. This was the situation in Daegu early in 2020 when COVID-19 had a huge surge of patients in the Daegu area. Only 11 intensivists, usually one or two per hospital, had to take care of more than 70 critical care Ill, critically ill COVID-19 patients, putting heavy burden on these doctors. These are the, some of the methods suggested by, uh, by, a critical, by critical care societies during a critical care manpower surge. For in the preparation, pr preparation phase, uh, you need to map all critical care trained staff in the hospital, define staff skills required, maintain an inventory of, of staff skill sets, redesign the division labor, for example, uh, you can create an intubation team or prone team and use them as a specialty team to help the, the, other, uh, the other personnel. Cross-train additional staff because you may need to uh, deploy people in different areas which they are not used to. Teach mass critical care standards operating procedures. Train to integrate with the hospital instant command system and develop uh, situation awareness tools. In acute, uh, 
When acute increases in staff is needed, recall resting staff, curtail non-essential activities such as elective surgery and outpatient clinics, and redeploy those staff to support critical care. And you can uh, also consider extending working hours. But in the long term, you need to retain as many uh, critical care specialists as possible by sheltering staff and their families, mitigating fatigue, providing transportation service, maintaining a safe working environment, and provide staff mental health care support, and have critical care extenders work with a care team within a care team model. During the COVID-19 crisis, uh, in some countries, medical students were used to fill the badly needed doctors, uh, fill the role of badly needed doctors in some countries. New technologies such as telemedicine and use of smartphone applications, remote monitoring may be a very effective way of providing quality care with minimum number of specialists with minimal risk of infection, and this should be used as much as possible. If there aren't enough intensivists or ICU trained nurses, you may consider a two-tier staff model where plausible. Uh, in this model, intensivists and ICU nurses provide oversight to non-intensivist clinicians and non-ICU nurses respectively. So role of the intensivist is to manage emergencies and uh, advise, advise non-intensivist on management. And non-intensivist -in provide routine care. You need to have clear, clear role definition and pre-printed pre order sets and institutional protocols uh, which, which, uh, which, uh, which will help the non-intensivists uh, take care of the, the critically ill patients. This is uh, an example of two-tier models suggested by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. In this model, one trained or experienced critical care physician support four non-ICU physicians who is in charge of six patients each. This is tiered ICU pandemic surge staffing algorithm suggested by Uni Universal Pittsburgh Medical Center for, their hosp for the hospitals in their system. Here you see uh, tier one, two, three, uh, three tiers of uh, clinical uh, 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 doctors seeing the patients and, and uh, the, the mix of them uh, is a little bit, little bit different from the SCCM model. Uh, this is staffing model of community-based ICU of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where they use telemonitoring and ICU application, app, app, application as much as possible. Also, procedure teams to minimize staff workload while not trying to compromise level of care is implemented. For nine ICU staff, proper training is essential. Uh, this uh, picture is the picture of education homepage for the nine intensivists developed by the Korean Society of, of Critical Care Medicine. It has many quality lectures on basic aspects of critical care. It was intended to educate the nine intensivists in basic concepts of critical care just in case two-tiered model is needed to expand the personnel in the ICU in response to COVID-19. This is photo of hands-on education session at the Ansang Medical Center, which expanded their ICUs to see critically ill COVID-19 patients with nurses and doctors who previously had very little ICU experience. Bundang, Seoul National University Hospital staff was instrumental in providing education and protocol so this ICU could run smoothly. What do you do even if more staff is needed? Uh, maybe you can consider emergency credentialing of medical volunteers. Uh, you should consider transfer, pa transfer patients to neighboring hospitals. 
aid from critical care professional societies and government? And maybe patient family can provide some care with appropriate guidance. Korean Society of Critical Care Medicine provided emergency relief to Daegu area working at a COVID-19 regional center at Daegu Dongsan Hospital. 22 intensivists from various hospitals and nine army doctors went to Daegu to care for the critically ill and help and and they were very uh they they provided very big relief to Daegu I Daegu COVID-19 response. Now let's talk about space. To free up spaces for pandemic patients, selective admissions, deferring elective surgeries and procedures should be considered. Also, uh, you need to evacuate lesser sick patients to lower levels of care or consider early discharge for lesser sick floor patients. First, uh, first utilize non-ICU acute, acute care spaces if more spaces are needed for contingency plan. Maybe pre and post anesthesia care units, step down units, and operating suits, procedure rooms, emergency department can be used for ICU. Uh, if in crisis mode, uh, you need also to consider uh, general ward as a place where uh, ICU patients can be cared for. Not only you need to consider physical space, but also to, because m many of them will need uh, ventilatory care, you need, you need to consider whether they have enough power, water, air oxygen supply, can be suctioned, expired air clearance, and if, if there's an infectious uh, crisis, uh, negative pressure to, to uh, minimize the risk of uh, spreading the disease, and also continuity of operation planning is uh, necessary. This is how regional and national authorities handled shortage of isolation facilities in COVID-19 pandemic in Korea. For asymptomatic and mild diseases, uh, they mainly use community isolation facilities. For mild to moderate disease, uh, COVID-19 designated hospitals uh, were designated. And many of these were main uh, government-run hospitals, but some of them had, uh, had, did not have critical capabilities, which was a problem. Also, they gave out incentives to expand government-designated isolation wards. For severe patients, at the beginning, most of the critically ill patients were cared for in the government-designated isolation wards. Then, when, when those spaces ran out, uh, the government asked tertiary centers to share uh, part of the burden. Then they handed out executive order to prepare for, to care for 10% of total beds for critically ill COVID-19 patients for the tertiary centers in December when the uh, third wave of COVID-19 uh, came very extremely close to, uh, to overburdening uh, and running out of ICU spaces for COVID-19 patients. Also, some hospitals were designated as centers for COVID-19 critically ill patients additionally. This is how we prepared at the Samsung Medical Center. Uh, so when a person visits the ER, the patient is first seen at a screening desk and which is outside the main ER. And if they have fever or, or are suspected to have COVID-19, they would go into this separate building outside of the main area of ER to get testing. Also, after the MERS experience, we built a separate annex to the main building which consists of eight negative pressure rooms, including two beds that can function as full ICU. 
These eight beds were converted to facilities where we could see COVID-19 critically ill patients for this COVID-19 pandemic. In December, uh, when the government mandate was issued, we had to convert another ward uh, to, uh, to additionally provide 12 more critically Ill, critical Ill beds to meet the government mandate. During the Daegu epidemic in early 2020, Daegu Donsan Hospital was designated as COVID-19 Regional Center. The building, this building, which functioned as tertiary referral center until April of 2019, was mostly vacant at that time because most of the facilities had been moved to a nearby new hospital. The building had infrastructure for 50 ICU beds and 20 operational ICU beds were quickly installed to care for critically ill COVID-19 patients from Daegu and Gyeongbuk area. These facilities was crucial in helping the Daegu medical community withstand the Daegu COVID-19 episode without medical system completely collapsing. These ICU beds were proudly operated by the intensivists organized by the Korean Society of Critical Care Medicine. This is a converted isolation ICU at the Ansung Medical Center. The ICU was modified to handle critically ill COVID-19 patients by erecting screen doors and sensors, glass wall for better visualization from nurses' station, and portable negative pressure pumps. Many hospitals did, did a very good job of uh, increasing their capacity to see these COVID-19 patients. For example, National Medical Center uh, used uh, converted former U.S. Army post buildings to COVID-19 uh, isolation wards. This is the picture of the outside of the building, and this is the inside of the building. Although these were not IC, ICUs, they were very crucial in uh, expanding the capacity of a national medical center in, in handling uh, COVID-19 crisis. Also, national medical center built modular ICU facility in, in their uh, parking lot of the hospital. This three-story complex houses 20 ICU beds and 10, 10 more step-down units that can be converted to ICU if needed. This is a picture of the finished building with uh, the picture of, uh, of, of a room inside the building. In El Salvador, due to lack of IC, a number of ICU beds compared to patient number, the authorities decided to convert uh, International Fair and Convention Center into a large hospital named Hospital El Salvador. Phase 1 construction started in March and ended in June of 2020. In all, 105 ICU beds and 143 intermediate care beds were taken were were uh, taken care by more than 300 general practitioners and about 500 nurses overseen by 18 critical care and internal medicine specialists helping through telemonitoring. They reported that they were a hugely successful endeavor. Now let's move on to stuff or supplies. Some of these are the, some of the essential supplies for mass critical care, uh, personal protective equipment, monitoring devices, respiratory support equipment, organ support equipment, and medication. Uh, first, in the preparation phase, you need to you have a list of medical equipment inventory, identify any deficiencies, obtain uh, insufficient equipment supplies through multiple channels as possible. And it would be very helpful if at the regional level, the, the, uh, the equipment were interoperable and compatible with other, other hospitals. Uh, PPEs, equipment, 
some of the medications that you need. Uh, these stuffs uh, would be better if they were uh, in uh, single-use items in a package kit. And also, pharmacal drugs uh, would be better if they were pre-mixed because they are easy to use. And point-of-care laboratory equipment will be very helpful. Lack of uh, personal protective equipment may jeopardize the safety of an ICU team and will decrease morale of the team. So it's very important to have enough personal protective equipment for your team. Amid the chaos of early phases of the pandemic, when the hospitals were overwhelmed with so many patients with respiratory failure and very few ventilators to care for them, there were, there were several reports of ventilating more than one patient with a single ventilator. But it is not recommended and may be very dangerous for the patient. So f for uh, all the critical care, mass critical care situation, prepare, conserve as much as possible, and substitute one resource if you run out of them. F when you are going on to contingency, maybe you should consider repurposing supplies or equipment, for example, using anesthesia machines to ventilate your patients. And maybe you can consider reuse to uh, conserve supplies. Uh, but relocating supplies that's uh, uh, taking treatment from one patient to, to give to another should only be limited to crisis setting. Last, uh, we'll talk some about structure. This is the structure of our hospital incident task force at Samsung Medical Center. It is very important to have clear chain of command and in the crisis response with the uh, director of ICU involved from the beginning. For relatively slow evolving mass critical care incident like the COVID-19, it is very useful if we can predict how many ICU beds will be needed for that incident. In, in this graph, blue bars uh, indicate, indicate daily number of cases, and the red bars is the daily number of critically ill cases for Korea. As you can see, the rise in uh, number of critically ill patients follow the number of uh, patients uh, with a la or the interval of around 10 or 14 days. So it, it is possible to develop a model to see how many critical patients will occur. And this will help in preparing uh, our team for the onslaught of the next wave. This graph shows the projected versus observed number of hospital patients for a day for Belgium. The model was very robust, with two lines almost going in unison. Also, communication and information sharing is very important. As protocol sharing, as also protocol sharing is uh, maybe very important because uh, there may be multidisciplinary team from different institutions, and these protocols will minimize errors and misunderstandings. And these protocols should be reviewed and revised regularly. To optimally respond to a pandemic, each hospital should have their communication channels open to work with each other uh, within a network and also work with the local regional authorities in contingency and national authorities in crisis situation. A good example of cooperation between hospitals was the relationship between National Health Insurance Service, Ilsan Hospital, and Severance Hospital. Ilsa Hospital was designated as Regional COVID-19 Center to care for critically ill COVID-19 patients, but they had little experience in handling these patients. So they reached out to Severance Hospital for help. So Severance Hospital uh, helped consulted on staff space stuff necessary in caring for these patients. An on-site consultation was done, sharing of protocols, 
regular online case reviews, rotation of house staff and transport consultation, and common data gathering was also uh, uh, gathering was done for future analysis. These are the protocols. And this is a screen capture of, of screen where doctors of two hospitals discuss how to treat COVID-19 pneumonia through long distance consulting. Uh, when resources are not deemed enough to care for all the critically ill, such as crisis situation, the paradigm has to shift from comprehensive care for everyone to providing greatest good for the greatest number. This is the last page. So augmenting critical care during pandemic is necessary to achieve maximum favorable outcome in these patients. Each hospital should work with local, regional, and national authorities to devise a plan that it can readily deploy in case of pandemic occurring. Korea was lucky in the experience submerged in 2015, laid the foundation on which it was able to respond to COVID-19. Plans for 4S, staff, space, staff, structure should be well thought out and training practiced. Uh, this is my last slide, and join us for the 6th Annual Asia-Pacific Conference on Early Mobilization and Rehabilitation in ICU on June 18th and 19th of this year. Thank you for your, thank you for your uh, participation on my lecture. Thank you.